Good afternoon. We are delighted you could join us for today's conversation in the arts, the feature event for this year's Signature Series. Now in its second year, the Signature Series celebrates UB's great legacy of innovation and distinction in the arts and letters. We are proud of our university's leadership in the Buffalo arts community, as well as our connection to the global arts community. It is these connections that have brought us all here today. This year, our signature series focuses on the role, impact, and complexity of the visual arts. We are pleased to highlight the amazing visual arts culture at UB, including the work of our students. In fact, I hope you have a chance to experience some of the dozen of events at UB throughout the month of April, showcasing a variety of student performances, exhibits, and creative activity across the spectrum of arts at UB. I invite you to view a full listing of signature series and related events on the website, the president's website, which is www.buffalo.ub backslash president. Thank you. <laughs> it, it sounds so good to say that, actually. <laughs> Especially for somebody who's a computer scientist, you know, it's really a, I love WWW. <laughs> Many of you joined us yesterday when we launched this year's signature series by opening a new exhibit in the Kabishwar Gallery on the fifth floor of Capen Hall. Please uh, come there and see the exhibit would be there for a while. It showcases the art of acclaimed and multifaceted American artist, Doug Fitt, who has joined us for today's conversation. I hope you will all have an opportunity to view this special exhibit. We are also delighted to welcome Yane Seren, director of Albright Knox Art Gallery to our campus today. I want to thank both Doug and Yane for their willingness to share their knowledge and experience in the arts with us. We are honored that two such significant figures in the art world will lead the dialogue on our campus. I would also like to welcome our friends from the local community, including our colleagues in higher education from area colleges and universities. I hope you are all looking forward to today's conversation as much as I am. Thank you again for coming. And now it is my pleasure to welcome College of Arts and Sciences Dean, Bruce Pittman, who will introduce our two distinguished guests this afternoon. Bruce. Thank you, Satish, and let me extend my welcome to everyone also. Um, I appreciate, Satish, in particular, the strong commitments to the arts that you've shown uh, it's certainly important to the college. Um, for everybody else, the College of Arts and Sciences is uh, the behemoth around for undergraduate education. 26 departments, including um, art, media study, music, theater, and dance. We also have some 16 academic programs, 23 centers, um, two art galleries, a major theater, and a music performance venue. Um, so we appreciate your support of all that goes on in the arts uh, and in the College of Arts and Sciences. As the President said, the Signature Series shines a light on um, art, uh, art as a fabric in this world, uh, art as challenging our thinking, as um, inspiring perhaps the noblest aspirations of man, and also providing comfort when we suffer the tribulations and losses that are so much part of our lives. So we're pleased to have with us um, Doug Fitch today, um, a visual artist, uh, a puppeteer, and um, a host of other uh, art activities um, who's going to talk with us about art in the world. Um, Doug is also the inaugural uh, WBFO College of Arts and Sciences visiting professor. He'll be in residence and in the college in the fall, so all of you will have a chance to uh, see more of him, work with him, uh, hopefully uh, come fall. Um, along with Doug, we're honored to have with us Dr. Yane Seren, uh, a um, art historian who served as director of the Helsinki Art Museum before coming to uh, Buffalo as the Peggy Pierce Elfin director of the Albright Knox, Arts, Albright Knox 
art gallery. Sorry. Um, so Yane thinks of Albright Knox as a, a real global asset. To hear him speak about um, art as a player on the civic stage, and in particular, Albright Knox um, as a place without walls, um, porous, uh, and spilling out into uh, a comprehensive cultural space that is the city of Buffalo. Uh, I want to thank Yane also for spending some time this morning with some of our uh, graduate students. He came in and um, spent a good part of the morning uh, interacting probably with many of you. Uh, I appreciate uh, his generosity in coming and spending time with us. This conversation has been billed as a fireside chat. Um, so all, for all of us, at least of a certain age, we have the image of the voice of Franklin Roosevelt uh, and the family in the drawing room sitting around the radio. Uh, at dinner last night, Yane and Doug went at each other. And we, we came to think that this might be more um, a far side chat <laughs> with um, their voices and Gary Larson drawing a radio. Let me now welcome Doug and Yane um, and ask them to talk with us about Wither the Arts. Yane, Doug, thank you. Hello. Is this thing on? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Are we sure? <laughs> Hi, Yana. Hi, Doug. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> Thank you well, so much for the... Anybody have matches? That would be a good idea. <laughs> actually, we should make it into a fireside chat. OK, I mean, actually, fortunately, something has been helping out here. So let's just flip this around. Yeah. I'll just blow on a fire a little bit there, and we can get it started. OK. Now we can have a f real fireside chat. That's much better. Something more combustible. <laughs> <laughs> this thing doesn't stay on. These machines, they never work. OK, anyway. I think we're all good. I think we're good. Now we can behave. Right? Now, okay. For a moment, anyway. <laughs> and uh, you know, I think the idea here is to um, imagine uh, a space that is language that you know, will just blast the ceiling away. Uh, because that's what you are supposed to do in a university, right? <laughs> you know, extend your thoughts beyond uh, what you think that their extent is. I think that's, I think that's true. Yeah. I think it's all about what do you, we, we all end up finding that we live in a world that we largely take for granted. And every time you stumble upon a moment, some exciting moment which says, gosh, I thought that's the way things were. And then you just find out they're not the way you thought they always were. And that's a great moment. And I think universities are about... How do we get as many of those moments in as compact time as possible? Because after it all, after you graduate, it often happens that you just go back to, into, you go back or you urge your, or you search for a life where you can take a lot more of things for granted, I suppose. Universal. Yeah. You know when I realized that we don't have to practice for today's talk was yesterday when we were having sort of a rehearsal lunch at the AK. And mm -hmm. it was for the purpose of, you know, kind of like I having an idea. just lunch. Oh, <laughs> there okay. was an agenda. Okay. <laughs> Museum people always have an agenda. <laughs> but when I realized that there's no need for an agenda was when we ordered dessert. I wasn't going to have any, but Doug, wisely enough, suggested that we should have some. And then I got a fork as well. And it was cold. You know, it came straight from the fridge. And he said, then we agreed that we should nuke it. And, and we did. And it sort of melted a little bit and turned out to be entirely different than the thing they actually brought in front of us. And this moment of braveness, this courageous moment when we intervened with nuke the chef's the dessert. desire and nuked the dessert showed to me I have a Renaissance man, Renaissance spirit next to me. We need no rehearsal. We can just come here and embarrass ourselves. I hope so. I really do hope so. So, so was, Doug, tell me what you're going to do at, uh, what are you doing? Well, uh, what am I, yeah, what am I doing? Uh, First of all, I just have to say it, it's a thrill and a delight, a real honor to be, uh, be here and doing this thing. And people say that, but sometimes you get into a position where it's actually, you say that and it's really true. It is a huge honor for me to be here and uh, very exciting. And I spent the morning talking with some great, great musicians who are part of this university and some great, great other visual artists and theater artists who are, I'm sure I'll meet more of, of them here, um, with whom I'm looking forward to 
collaborating, um, and uh, collaborating on a piece of work of storytelling, which I think, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, because it's still kind of emerging or emergent in my imagination. But I'm trying to find words to describe what it starts to look like in my head. And, it's, and it, what I'm thinking the best way to describe it is as, as sort of an opera of images, uh, which requires a certain kind of performer to uh, connect the, the, the moments in this, uh, this world. Um, and the, the world is uh, generated or underscored by music. And what kind of music? Well, I am fascinated by the fact that there's this incredible new music world here at, in Buffalo. And, that's what it's going to be. Uh, uh, what is new music? Uh, all music was new once, and we tend to forget when we talk about classical music that it, it is a really stupid delineation, frankly. We, we shouldn't talk about classical music anymore. <laughs> we'll just same, talk about music. Same goes for visual art. All art at the moments of its inception is contemporary. So when we say, I don't understand contemporary art, well, which contemporary are you talking about? The 1400 contemporary or the now? You're just too young, or you're just too old. <laughs> 1,400. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? I mean, it's amazing when you think, uh, OK, when you walk through, when I was a kid, and I would walk through the Metropolitan Museum or some museum, my father had a tremendous aff affiliation and, in and interest in Chinese art, which I had really le next to no interest in. But, but when I say next to no interest, it's not that I had no interest. But I didn't, uh, it was so abstract and so esoteric or something like that. Um, so I would look at all these pictures that looked like pictures I could recognize. And I didn't really understand that the Mark Rothko's or things were particularly interesting either. But when you, know, you get older and when those little moments come upon, you, you, you stumble upon those moments where you say, oh, I didn't realize he was actually painting a painting the same, for the same reasons that you know, Courbet was painting. I, I didn't know that. And then you realize, it just looks different because we, he, he saw some, another version of that kind of reality, and that reality is being a human being at a certain time, in a certain place, in a certain context, and it just looks different, and it feels different. It, it ex, uh, the expression of contemporary art comes in m many different colors and varieties, but it actually is ultimately always a reflection of who you are, and there is a literacy element to this that applies both to music and to visual art. When people say to me, you know, I work in the visual art realm more than in the music realm, let's say, because I can't carry a tune worth shit, so I, you know, I won't sing. Well, that's the, why they have wheelbarrows. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's the image I have in my head. Yeah. So people, you know, you think of a work of art that you really don't understand, and uh, then I start inquiring. What's well, what, like what? Like, well, <laughs> you know, um, how many of you have been to the Albright Knox recently? I have. Some, okay, maybe, well, what am I gonna use as an example? There's a work by Theasta Gates. He's an African-American artist from Chicago, uh, and this work is composed of fire, uh, pieces of fire hose. Now, you're looking at this work and you're thinking, you know, what's, you know, I could have taken that fire hose and cut it with, you know, scissors or a sharp knife and composed this kind of almost monochromatic panel. And what's the point here? Well, when you start to think of the civil rights movement in the 60s, and the symbolic import of a fire hose to a certain community and to the history of America from the 1960s until today, suddenly that fire hose obtains a deeper resonance than it in a flickering moment as you dash by it might have. So just the same way as with Shakespeare's King Lear or Othello or whatever, you need certain clues and keys to enter its world. The same holds true for uh, a work of musical art or visual art. Uh, and I think that you know, the work that you do, which engages so many different uh, sensory systems through its manifestation, the musical, the visual, the theatrical, uh, the time-basedness of it, you know, it, it really sort of uh, becomes a Gesamtkunstwerk, a holistic work of art that uh, appeals to different uh, facilities, let's say. I love this word and always have Gesamtkunstwerk. Everybody heard this word? So nice. People are nodding. It's great. It's like a normal thing. Yeah, yeah, I had a Gesamtkunstwerk here, but it went away. I had to sell it. 
Well, I always thought it would be fun to, have, to invent the Gesundheit Kunstwerk. Ah, because that's then, more challenging. Well, I think it's time has come because everyone's so health conscious. The Gesundheit is... <laughs> Legalize it. It <laughs> just adds a new dimension. It's like you exercise with your painting or something. Yeah. Maybe that's a we. Maybe that's one of those we things. I don't know. I haven't tried those out. But, but I, I wonder, so here's a related question, since yes. you're talking about a fire hose. You still have to tell us about your thing, you know, the... Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah, okay. If we, if Don't forget. Oh, no, okay, I'll try. Um, Go ahead. I won't forget. I'll make a note. <laughs> <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> it's a fireside toilet. <laughs> still warming up. Um, so, uh, no, I was thinking, the fire, the, the fire hose, see, fireside, fire, fire hose. everything's it's, it's, connected. It's an obvious connection. <laughs> Fire um, will put it out. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, fi using a fire hose, which is obviously an object with a, 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 an enormously functionally designed, um, and then later it is tr somehow taken out of the context of its usefulness. I mean, and then put finds itself as an object that had once a value that was defined entirely by its function. Yeah is now being uh, created, given a, an entirely new value that has no function whatsoever as, uh, as a fire hose, right? Um, that's a pretty interesting trajectory for an object. Yes. Um, and it makes me think, well, when you, when you think about what is the function of art, is it to be useless? Is it important that a, art is actually useless uh, in order to be a functioning work of art? Mm. Um, it, when you go, <laughs> um, it's a question, it's a dilemma, let's yeah. say. <laughs> Because yeah. that uh, it's you, like you a kiss, can... not very functional, but yet we like it. I mean, most of us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's very time-based. Everybody above eighteen. <laughs> That's more like a Gesundheit Kunstwerk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but if you go to the Smithsonian Institute down there, and there's a there's an African uh, section. And I remember seeing there's things on, on display. There's like this beautiful wooden spoon and this beautiful wooden comb and, this, and, and there's masks and there's all these things, yes. which there's no paintings. Uh, I said there is no painting. Sorry, I know it's a college thing. There are no paintings. <laughs> and, um, but it's filled with these incredibly beautifully crafted objects that are filled with soul. And they have been taken out of their realm of usefulness for which they were originally intended and put into a museum where they're being used in a different way. And that different way is what I think is interesting to sort of ask. Yes. What is it? What happens to the aura uh, of the object uh, once it is once, twice, or thrice, or more detached from its uh, original place? Um, you know, I had a real dilemma that with this this topic when I came to the museum field from academia, so from the classroom. Uh, and parachuting. Uh, please, that's classified okay, information. Sorry. I mean, only, only like Putin and Bush know about it. And the Finnish president, of course. They're painting pictures of each other <laughs> these days, you know. That's, they're making I know, art. I know. And so I'm jumping out of airplanes for the sake of the two of these <laughs> geeks. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Minus the jumping out of airplanes and helicopters okay. bit. All right. um, I came from a university and went to a university. From New York to Jerusalem, two very different cities and in some ways similar. Um, and in Jerusalem, as I was teaching, uh, about 30% of my students were MFA students and the rest were art history majors. MIA students. <laughs> uh, MIT, CIA, <laughs> all of that. Yes, they were there as well, in the back row taking notes avidly. <laughs> How fast do you run a mile? <laughs> no, I don't anymore. <laughs> um, one of the problems I had with the museum was that it seemed like a place where intellectual energy sort of vacuum cleaned, hoovered out of things. Uh, because of the clinical nature of a museum. It's sort of like, you know, it's almost abstract. Like if you imagine this podium to be the museum space, and this of course is the valuable art object. Oh, thank you. Yesterday sold for a million, tomorrow <laughs> for two. And now, yeah, this is yesterday, like it's outside the museum now. Not art, art, not art, art. I mean, it's sort of an abstract, you know, thing like what happened over there? Like <laughs> who makes the thing move and who decides and how does it happen? Um, and I was very sort of critical uh, of, of this imaginary, magical, transformative curtain between the 
beyond the museum space and within the museum space that somehow defines what is art. Uh, uh, a transformative wall that is especially resonant today because we live in a world where contemporary art, the art that's being produced in our time, it is not only, uh, you know, it actually does have a function. It's a new asset class, as, as somebody from Sotheby's or Christie's will tell you. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, it's sort of the greenback of tomorrow. Um, shake your assets? <laughs> shake your assets, shake your art. <laughs> so, but, but then, I, I, as I worked more with museums and started to really collaborate with curators uh, with artists, I realized that at its best, the museum can become a hub of, uh, of intellectual energies. It can become a dynamic space where the object is not just a dead thing on the wall, but it can become, in a sense, the, the hearth, the, the place that inspires and uh, you know, enables one to, you know, Life doesn't really exist because it's only a, a flickering moment that we are in at any given moment. It's like you're driving a car at 100 miles an hour, or most of you maybe 60, uh, and, and you look in the rearview mirror, and you know that's where you're coming from, hopefully 60, uh, and, and you see a picture of the, the path traveled, and at the same time you're looking forwards, but you're never really there because you're somewhere in between what you see in that rearview mirror and the scenery and landscape that, you know, evolves in front of you. Um, it's almost like language. If you freeze language, existence stops. If you say any word, and say any word, say one word now. Gamutlik. Gamutlik. Okay, now stop in the middle of, <laughs> Bruce, of course you would say that. If you stop in the middle of Gamutlik and like Gamut, there's silence. Life stands still. Oral culture, music, you know, these things are, life is lived in those things. That's why, you know, the stilled word is in some ways the stilled life. And that was the fear I had for the work of art on a museum wall, that it wouldn't become the stilled <laughs> life, the dead thing, the inanimate, the, you know, the, the, the kernel of our existence that is no longer part of us. And it is up to all of us uh, as individuals and as communities and as societies and as really I think nations are a failed thing. I was talking to uh, some of your colleagues last night about this. Uh, Bruce Pittman, uh, uh, an amazing star to have, by the way, as, as your champion here. Uh, and I, I really think that nations are bound to fail. I mean, I, th there are reasons why they exist, but I really believe in cities and communities. I think they are the way to change uh, the And tribes. And tribes, of course, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and army units are, you know, they'll... <laughs> God, no, why I, did I, you get me? <laughs> I'm sorry. But I re remember the word porous was used, and the yes. and walls, and, you know, the, I, were your words transposed by Satish uh, to describe your new... Uh, idea about the museums, like a wallless place or something that has more right. porous. Yeah. And uh, I, it just made me think what you're saying. I think uh, we, we, when we think about something going into a museum, it's terribly sad, for example, these music instrument museums where you go and you look at these instruments <laughs> sitting behind glass. <laughs> no one's playing them. <laughs> sad. Yeah. But, uh, we should liberate them. We should liberate them. <laughs> <laughs> Set them free. A, Let think, them dance. You're right. Let them dance. Let them make music. And let's hear what that music is. Um, we saved its amateur. That was something we were thinking about. Um, yeah. Wouldn't that be weird? Never mind. Yeah. Was, like, that was a kiss thing, too. Yeah. So the kiss to an instrument is an amateur to a human. No. It was terrible. Uh, so we are thinking about the world of what was, what, what is a thing, and how it is, goes from being to becoming. Yes. And I think when you embrace the notion of something that isn't simply as it is, it is right. something that is always in a, sense, in a state of um, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis and flux, yeah. not because of itself necessarily, but because it's set up to be seen and to be, um, uh, and, and to be eaten, <laughs> to be, um, what's the word? And yeah, eaten, devoured. Yeah, devoured by people out there. Yeah. I remember having this experience, and, and I, yeah. I tell you, if, have you all, anyone seen the Anselm Kiefer show here yet that's there? This is an, ex yeah, right, yeah, mm. this is an extraordinary, extraordinary show. 
Because I think what you've done with that show is to prove that, in fact, paintings, albeit gigantic Wagnerian gesamt Kunstwerk paintings, um, which weigh a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The big one, the seascape, 1,600 uh, pounds. That's, that's the frame is lead. Talk of dangerous materials. Redefining landscape painting. Yeah, right. <laughs> It is a landscape in itself, but they're really exquisite. But not only are they exquisite paintings, but uh, by, by, by actually showing them in this way in the museum, uh, they are, I think, given many other dimensions. Or off, they, it, it offers the a public a, a way to engage with a painting in a completely mm. much more multi-dimensional, much, much more synesthetic way. You sit on very comfortable, bouncy IKEA chairs, I'm told they're IKEA. Which are going to go on auction afterwards? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Chairs that have been used to see a painting by Anselm Kiefer. The price goes up. <laughs> the world will go crazy. Uh, Edition of 34. That's right. <laughs> Sat in by, let's see. You know, uh, list. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's when asses do become assets. That's <laughs> talk, talk, talk of assets. <laughs> But you know, that's, that's the thing. Uh, what we wanted to create in those spaces and with those works was uh, a, a space for metamorphosis. Because mm -hmm. often what happens in a museum, it's like walking through library stacks. You're not really reading the book, walking through the library stack. You're looking at the, and in a museum, you know, you just observe this, especially in the supermarket, I mean MoMA. Yeah, in, you, you just walk and you, you're looking at the label, label, label. And there's a reason I say that, mm. because people still talk about their nostalgia for the old moment, because it actually allowed a deep, different type of engagement with individual works of art. Uh, but but now, don't you think we're also labels, like label crazy I anyway? know, I know. Like, it's like, you know, it's labels it all It says around. Libby's, Libby's, Libby's on the label, label. <laughs> yes. Like it, like yeah, it, yeah. like it on your table, table, table. I don't know that You one. don't know that one? It's pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> But if it says if it says Rothko, can you oh, it's do good. that in Finnish? In Finnish? Yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. <laughs> he speaks like yo. twelve languages. He'll teach in thirteen. <laughs> uh, mm. But the idea is that when you give a single space to a single work and you kind of pose the chairs over there, right. you are setting the stage for a different type of an interaction with a work of art. That it, and it's intentionally the poetics of space are there so that you can become the activating brain muscle for that work of art. It's a piece of theater. You've created a piece of theater. It, it actually is a totally a time-based time thing. I've lied. I have a theater degree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You what? <laughs> you didn't say you that. You know what was the first play I was in? It was called Androcles and the Lion. I was a lion. <laughs> I was 12. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> in Lugano, well, Switzerland. I remember it vividly. <laughs> Well, when right I was next to 10, Herman Hesse's I was, home. I was the cowardly lion. We were oh lions. My, oh, no, oh, my <laughs> lost lump species made. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. It's when, a zoo. When, when's your birthday, by the way? 29th of September, St. Michael's Day, and I have a story about You're that. You're not a Leo, then. No, I'm, I, am. I'm, I'm, I keep the world in balance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway. Harmony prevails. Funny thing about Kiefer, you know, this, yeah. he, he's a... He's a um, an artist, of course, who has had a serendipitous path uh, from the moment when he was born in Cologne as the city was being bombed by the Allies, final days of World War II, now lives in, in, in France. And those of you who have been to Paris maybe have heard of a department store called La Samaritaine. Well, La Samaritaine had to close. Which, if you pronounce it in English, is Samaritan. Yeah, Samaritan. Okay. It's like, yeah, we're a department store. Samaritan. <laughs> Uh, in this Good Samaritan, you actually had to pay for the goods you... We're here for you. Yes. Why pay less? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. 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 <laughs> so for some uh, structural reasons in the building that turned out to be unsurmountable, La Samaritan closed uh, in around 2005 or so. And Kiefer bought La Samaritan's warehouse outside of Paris. The that. entire warehouse. And this thing is... Huge. I mean, you, uh, he has a few assistants there, and they all go around with bicycles. You know, it's like uh, two football courts. Or it's just enormous. And uh, this is his production space, where these works are really living. And, and in one space, he'll work with one work of art. And the way these works are produced is that, you know, it's like the human skin. They shed. So, you know, pigment will fall off, and 
when you, when you bring one of these apparatuses, these machines, these paintings to a museum where we are like paranoid about something changing on the surface of it, so suddenly, you know, like a trinket of paint falls and there's like two special forces guys diving underneath <laughs> it, like, catching it and like trying to reattach it to the location. And Anselm comes in and says, <laughs> and it's like, okay, don't oh, worry about it. Don't worry about that one, <laughs> worry about the other. Yeah. <laughs> For him, so, the works are supposed to be metamorphosed and change all the time. So hmm. if you remember our work, Milstrasse, which is the kind of autumnal landscape with these two stretches of kind of canvas right. that almost like the straps of a parachute, incidentally, <laughs> that hold this cornucopia in the middle of this desolate field. Well, one of those straps had become undone over the years uh, since 1988 when we acquired it. Now when we reinstalled it, we realized, oh, well, you know, we compared it to the photograph and, you know, the conservator's heartbeat is going up and, you know, emergency crews are calling. So I call Anselm in Paris and say, Anselm, what are we going to do? You know, this trap has, just staple it. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, oh, okay, wait, wait one. And I say, Anselm says we should staple it. And like two conservators almost like quit their job. <laughs> and, no, it's against our professional ethics. <laughs> well, I mean, they're really great. And, but, but, you know, the job is, job is to protect and serve uh, and make sure that not, yeah, nothing it's, it's changes. So, it's so uh, ultimately, we glue gunned it because you know, the answer was, no, wait, 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 glue gun it. And they said, well, okay, we're going to glue gun it. <laughs> and and the, so, you know, I actually took the glue gun and you know, I got up there and we're going to glue gun it. <laughs> then the, finally, my staff members were <laughs> like, okay, okay, maybe we should do it. You may actually, like, shoot a hole into that thing if we let you loose. Uh, things okay. change over time. Think yeah. of the Renaissance frescoes in wonderful cities in Florence. You know, it's not like they are in you know uh, HVAC conditions uh, of uh, 68 to 72 Fahrenheit, uh, humidity 45 to 55, which is what's considered museum climate zone. Uh, is that right, Brian? Yeah. Uh, do I have it on target? <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> um, so you know, art has been exposed to the environments and to to things like the audience, imagine that. I mean, you know, art has actually been exposed to people for many, many millennia, and, and uh, we at museums are very concerned about this. Yes. <laughs> caves. Caves. <laughs> right. Don't, lo don't breathe in the caves, because it destroys the polychromization. <laughs> Yes, isn't that true? It, it, it yeah, is true. I know. See, you know, I'm... think of the Lascaux. <laughs> How many of you have heard of the Lascaux caves in France? Uh, some of the oldest. Uh, sort of cave painting in the world. Well, you can't go there anymore because you're breathing. Oh, unless you're not breathing. Right, right. I mean, you have to hold like your breath for like, I don't know, 24 hours yeah. or 12 or an hour even. Uh, and now, now they have some kind of diver's equipment that they can you know, use so that uh, a, a rebreather, I think it's called, but so that nothing is emitted into the zone of the Lascaux cave so that you know, these caves can uh, remain without the impact of the bacteria that may be emitted by the human breath. Okay, well, I understand if, you know, if there are many people there, maybe it could change uh, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the factor. Of the but you know, I, now you're, you're reminding me, cave, well, cave paintings, and we're talking about theater. And, and, yes. And we're talking about uh, experiential sort of imagistic, we're, I'm using a lot of very important words right now, so. That, but I, I went into the caves, not the ones that... Let's go. I, I went into let's go. They, they let, let you in? No. You're they, humanoid. No, no, no. I, I didn't go into the actual caves, but okay. what they've done, if you've been there recently, no. is they've, well, it's been over the last 11 years or something. They incredibly carefully reconstructed the caves in only the way I think the French government could do, which is every single thing is completely perfect. And it, it's impossible to imagine that you're not in the la actual okay. Lascaux case. Well, there you go. But what, what's, what it means is this is a perfect simulacrum, and everyone's lining up to see the caves, which aren't the caves. The caves are, caves are over there, and you can't go inside them. But what they're doing is you're getting this tour through the caves with every, mm -hmm. which was scanned by a computer and recreated by hand and by a computer, and some uh, art historian painter went in and actually reconstructed all the paintings yeah. quite perfectly. What I learned when I was there was um, these paintings are painted not on flat canvas surfaces, of right. course, but on concave and convex shapes. And sometimes you have like the shape of a bull or a shape of a, another animal, um, and, and it looks as if, oh, the artist didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> he painted it three times. <laughs> 
Well, that, but if you take a candle and you move it around, suddenly those three times are seen differently and the shadows interplay. And it looks like the bull is actually running. And it's uh, chilling because it's a completely animated film that's going on. Because what we forget is it's, you can't see anything without light. Light is how we make it. We provide for the light too, just the way you lit yes. the Anselm Kiefer paintings. We bring light into the theater in very special situations like that. And in many museum situations, you have a light on the picture just to look at that little window. So it, so it makes me think like what, what my job is or what I hope to Lock do. the doors, people are leaving. <laughs> Satish, you promised. <laughs> He's gone Mr. though. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Took the key with him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but right. this is an interesting point because yeah. here's the question. The Lascaux cave paintings are dated roughly you know, 14,000 years before the beginning of the Common Era. So they're about 16,000 years old. The question is this. Is Not the ones I saw, they were no, only no, no, 11 years old. They were like 11 years old. <laughs> and here's the point. Does, does something that's like 16,000 years old have a different aura, whatever we mean by uh -huh. that, than something that's 11 years old, even if they look the same? Uh, is, you know, when you say aura, I'm going to use the word story. Ah, okay. Well, and I... Stora. I, uh, no. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting uh, concept because, you know, mm. we have put such value on the touch of the creative genius on the fingerprint, especially in so far as visual art is concerned. Before but, you know, we, 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 we don't care if we read Othello in an edition from 2013 <laughs> or the original manuscript, which you know Shakespeare or one of his lovers or assistants uh, wrote. It doesn't. It, we we read whichever year is edition, and that is the artwork that we, through our act of reading, we give life to it. But with the Picasso, you know, if it's a fake, it's like. Oh, really? And let's take it a step further, if we can. Please. When we start talking about, uh, we bring Duchamp into the mix. Absolutely. And he the, created the, fakes as There's not as a talk without the pissoir. That's right. There's no meaning without mutt. That's right. <laughs> Is everybody familiar with the fountain from 1917? How many of you are familiar with the fountain from 1917? Are. Are. Yeah. Okay, are. so this we're going to have to go have a word or two about this. This yeah. might be one of those moments. No. So Duchamp was one of the great, strange Dada, pre-Dada, post-Dada artists who, uh, who really did kind of change the course of how we perceive art. And one of the discerning moments was when he decided to take a urinal uh, off the wall and put it on a pedestal <laughs> up on a, you know, 90 degree angles from how it was normally used, uh, take it, re change its function, <laughs> Um, from some dirty piece of, you know, your, well, it was a urinal, and to, to bring it high up into the echelons of, of, of artistic practice by, by putting it once again on this pedestal. In an exhibition in, space. In an exhibition space, once again, like, just like you were doing with that wall <laughs> inside. Yeah. He brought it in the space, put it on the pedestal, had the clout and the, what, the... The wherewithal. The wherewithal, well, yeah. also, and, and also the credentials, to, to, so the people would say, oh, he's doing that, so it must mean something. And he took it one step further. He signed it not Duchamp, but R. Mutt, M-U-T-T. -T. He made up a persona that would uh, have made this transformation. And he called it a ready-made. And he said, there's already too many objects in the world. I, as an artist, don't have to contribute to the mass of too many objectsness. Might as well just use some of the objects that are already there and just repurpose them into the world of art. And as you can see, that probably it didn't make a lot of people happy. Many people were very confused by this. And pissed off. And friend. pissed off. <laughs> it was a pissoir. Yeah. <laughs> it was the point. <laughs> this was, uh, this, hap his, uh, uh, this happened, he's a French man. He travels to New York. This happens in New York City during World War I, in the last year of the war, really. I forgot, but it's so important to remember the context, too. So now when we say, what is a copy of that, he made many copies of this thing. But when you say, what's the copy of a fraudulent work of art that was intended to be made 
right. by a completely other persona that was invented by the artist. Yes. And if we take it a step further and we talk about Jeff Koons, for example, who doesn't ever touch any of his art, has never made anything as far as I'm concerned, isn't that Except correct? Chicholina. Except his wife, yes, the porn star. Um, I don't know if he made her. Well, yeah, he did no, make he her. Yeah. her. <laughs> this is bad. The kiss, once again, we get back to that. Gesundheit, kurz weg. So, uh, but yes, when we talk about, like, I, I just bring this up because yes. we're talking about value yes. and function. And, and the meaning of art to us today. today. So if you make a balloon dog, a do you know, the, do you know the Jeff Koons balloon dogs? Is this something that people are nodding pretty much about? That's good. Okay, look up Jeff Koons online, balloon dog. And they can be small or enormous. enormous, huge. And they are, most recently, I think one of them was sold for $6 million at, at uh, the Christie's uh, or Sotheby's. 12, in fact, I think. 12? 11, 12. Uh, well, the interesting thing about it was that it was not only, uh, it wasn't a unique piece, it was a, one of an edition of six by an artist who didn't make it. <laughs> right. So, we're, I mean, when you talk about authenticity... Do you know that Abba song, Money, Money? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought that was an impressionist song, Money, Money, Money. <laughs> yeah, right. No, that, oh, that's another one. Okay. Well, when the we think... The precursor to Abba. <laughs> <laughs> money, Money. So, when you... Uh, when, but when, in the meantime, today, yes. there are people who are sitting around highly paid and lots of money going to authenticate something that might have been a Rembrandt, might not have been a Rembrandt. If it is a Rembrandt, somehow it's much more valuable. It's not as valuable maybe as a Jeff Koons, but it's, but it's certainly suddenly not valuable at all if it turns out to be made in a way that is almost as good as Rembrandt, by the way, but <laughs> right. maybe not maybe even branded with his name. Well, yeah. the, the, and here's the thing. So we live in a society, and I think part of the reason why uh, it's very diff difficult to assess meaning and the metamorphosis of meaning is because we are able to transfer and dispatch information so quickly from one place to another. <laughs> meaning, we're having this conversation here about a Jeff Koons in a certain context with a certain introduction and flags uh, behind <laughs> us and, you know... Fire time. Um, <laughs> But now you will have an artist in Beijing, an MFA student, who hasn't listened in on this conversation, and he goes online and he finds these Jeff Koons things, and they transmigrate visually into his works. He's never seen a Jeff Koons, but the Jeff Koons that he just sees as an image on the surface of his screen is tomorrow part of his artistic practice. Maybe because he liked the form, Maybe because he found something in this kind of soft but hard-looking image interesting. Who knows what? But the transmigration of meaning is so rapid and complicated that to assess the meaning of works becomes difficult. Hence the importance, I believe, today of the classroom, of the exchange. And usually I really prefer <laughs> talks these days to be ones of interactivity, a conversation. So we better ask some questions. Questions? <laughs> we have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> uh, but you still have to talk a little bit about what, what you're going to do. But I do. With the, with the kind of premise and foil of what, what is it sure. that makes the meaning of a work of art today? So, um, okay, when I came, when I was growing up, and I was a very little person. Little person. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you understand. <laughs> I was a little person. I was a young person, a smaller person than I am today. And, and uh, I was always interested in just making things. It made me happy. I, you know, simple as that. I liked to glue felt onto glass jars. And uh-oh, this no, was I the end. What's happening? I knew. No. You will all so fail. We know why you're leaving. <laughs> you have class, I'm sure. Take care. <laughs> it's, it's we will good, good file part. a formal a good... complaint to your teacher. <laughs> it's like half the auditorium left. <laughs> Oh, well. Oh. I got to Have pity on me. I have an operation. <laughs> I have a wound in my side. I'm bleeding. <laughs> Don't go. So um, it was kind of bad timing when I just started talking about the show. No I'm kidding. <laughs> it happens, you know. You can't win them all. Uh, so I was, I was thinking, uh, I, just, I, I just enjoyed making things. And I, I, as I went through and school and got 
uh, into high school, and then I just never stopped making things. And I, I realized that uh, I had a, I did, I went to a, a pretty rural school in Connecticut, mm -hmm. and it was, we had an art department. One, our one art teacher, who was the most insane person in the in the school, she was. Yes. Everyone thought she was nuts. The reason was she was nuts. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but anyway. I never understood wh how I would ever be able to know whether I had become an artist or not, and whether what it was. I didn't know how, who's going to tell me that I am now an artist where I wasn't before, and or I'm now I've earned the right to call. Yeah, see, call myself. Somebody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> So in a, in, a, in a world where you're never told these kinds of things, it's a little bit like, how do you know you went from boyhood to manhood? He's like, oh, he did it. Now he's a man. They used to tell you these things. They used to go through a little ritual, and then after that ritual, boom, now you're a man. <laughs> <laughs> or a woman. <laughs> but uh, is that, and, and fortunately, there are graduate programs, and you get a PhD, and then you can say that you're an artist or something like that. But actually, it might be more d and, subtle and, than that. And, and which type of an artist? Because right. I think that one of the things that was so interesting to me as I was sort of looking at your practice from you know, your days in college to really to today is that you've touched on so many different fields. And we come from a century that is supremely siloed, meaning you know, you're a printmaker, do not sculpt or you know <laughs> you play the violin don't touch the piano <laughs> or or or, true, or true. My, my god if you play the piano and you paint that's like well you're not sentence. serious then, then you're not a serious person at all because you're doing like two different disciplines and if you are you know let's say a mathematician <laughs> and an artist i mean then then we just send you away to right <laughs> we just don't talk to you because you cannot be serious so you know here's the interesting thing think of we have a thing called theoretical physics, right? You've heard of theoretical physics. I don't know what it is, but I know like, smart people like Stephen Hawking do it. You know, theoretical physics, because you, you know, th there's no way to drill the universe. But let's say that you are a, 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 a researcher of, I don't know, some sort of specialized cancer, like colon cancer. You will actually drill that research hole with your team so deep down into the conceptual earth of your discipline. The colon? Mm, just bear with me. <laughs> oh, I should have picked like brain tumors. <laughs> Semicolon. But, but you are so deep in that research that now yeah. if you would have to think of the human heart and the aorta and the articles that pertain to that in your medical mm. community, you have no idea because all your life you've specialized, specialized, specialized. And if you have not heard of theoretical medicine, it's because it really doesn't exist. And where it exists, it's not regarded as serious medicine by Western standards. Places like China, China. where, by the way, people die uh, much less frequently of colon cancer and other things that uh, uh, plague us over here. Um, a kind of a holistic view of the world is very very important, I think and I think that we both these days are. Right now. Yes, it's really important. It, it's it's very important for our survival, and uh, you know, crazy people such as ourselves, we 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 try to um, talk the talk and walk the walk because it is important to climb out of the 20th century silos uh, into uh, a 21st century where while grounded in serious research and while based in deep thought, we have visibility beyond our solipsistic, somewhat egocentric area of specialization. And, and that's why I personally love the American uh, liberal arts education system because at least it you know, gives you some visibility of what's going on in the field of the neighbor after you have become a man. Uh, you know, because in Europe, oh, in, in my country, in my home country, oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah, I can't. <laughs> but, uh, I used to be able to, but <laughs> something happened. Uh, you became a woman. Yes, uh, I, it was one of those special forces missions. Very special forces. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> He's bad. Um, in, you yeah. know, 
in a European university system, you basically have, have to, to decide choose. at age 18, okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna become an Egyptologist. Mm. What the hell? I mean, how, how can anybody know at age 18 if they're going to become an Egyptologist or not? I mean, that's just, it, so I, I'm, a, I'm a strong, strong proponent of the idea that you, you study diversely in your initial years of higher education so that you both gain uh, the, the, the capacity to understand things that lie beyond your realm. And don't you ever, if you become a Wall Street banker and whatnot, you know, look mockingly at the masterpieces that you will find in places like operas and museums, because uh, then you're not doing your, your civil, civic duty, uh, I, I think, personally. You know, it's really important to, to have always the respect for the other. Uh, it's, the, it's the principle on which this uh, great uh, nation of states, in the United States, is based on, that kind of freedom. So let's not kill it. By, by being so specialized that we can't go beyond our, ourselves. Well, when we talk about specialization, of course it's everywhere, and one of the I dangers we're talking about is special forces. Special forces. <laughs> when we talk about specialization, and as I said, it's, it's basically rampant everywhere. I mean, you see, in the last 30 years, there have been more cookbooks published than there ever were. I mean, before, people used to just cook. Now you can't cook without a photograph of the thing you're gonna cook. You know, and it is somehow, that's a synesthetic idea in a sense. You're, you're looking at this image of something that Martha Stewart created and made it look really beautiful and you want to reproduce that because you can sort of taste the image. So, but you don't want to do it wrong. So maybe it's better just to go and get Martha Stewart's mix because she's the expert and she's a specialist and we're going to trust her because she's given us every reason to trust her. So we, now, <laughs> hasn't she? <laughs> Okay, other departments maybe less so, but still. She's really good with a hot glue gun, by the way, if you need it. <laughs> I, I, I can only believe you. But, uh, but I would say that when we start trusting everyone but ourselves, uh, because everyone's a specialist, everyone's an expert at something that we're not experts at, then we really start believing less and less uh, that we can do anything. And uh, it's important to remember, I think, uh, I don't come from, what I, when I think about, people tell me I'm doing all sorts of different things, but honestly, it doesn't feel that way. It always feels to me like I'm just doing the next project, which happens this time to entail food, and last time it entailed furniture. And so the next time we will eat the furniture and <laughs> <laughs> sit on the food. <laughs> We've done that. <laughs> um, actually, kind of similarly, but I'll tell you about that later. Um, but yeah, it does feel like when you, uh, when you slip, when you do the little thought experiment about, experiment about what was it like to be uh, living a life uh, 150, 200 years ago when, there, when, you know what, you went out in the field, you made your food, you, you probably you sewed your clothes or someone next to you did. There wasn't any Pret-a-Porter. Right. <laughs> every, every article of clothes was made specifically for you and your body and your shoes were also made for you and your body. And, um, and nobody was telling you that in order to wear their clothes, that will make you an individual because you'll look like everybody else in the Abercrombie and Fitch catalog. But um, never mind, they're all individuals, don't worry about that. Um, but we do have a, a, a peculiar way of telling our, our, our audience that it's a sort of schizophrenic message, which is, be yourself, buy my thing. <laughs> in order to be yourself. <laughs> Abercrombie Fitch. I know, see, Abercrombie and Fitch. It's something like Fitch. <laughs> I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be advertising, but in fact, I guess I am. But that's very true. So uh, that's what's exciting for me about doing this project here is because I get to tap into all sorts of these realms of uh, that are represented by a lot of different kinds of es experts, and and from what I can see, everyone's really interested in the uh, in the uh, connective tissue between what they're doing and what everyone else is doing, like yourself and like uh, David Felder. And, and uh, the, 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 I've just seen that there's an interest in if we're making music, it, what does it look like? And if we're, if we're uh, painting a painting, what does it sound like? I mean, yeah. David was at the museum looking at the uh, uh, Anselm Kiefer paintings yesterday with uh, another important composer. Yeah, I think Roger, what's his name? I forgot his last name. But, um, Sitting down 
these two composers looking at this painting, thinking, just I was li listening to it. it. I mean, really amazingly true. Yeah. So that cross-referenciation, the cross-pollinization, I think that's... Uh, Is that something you're experiencing as students? Do you get that? And do you, do you, do you get a sense that you be of cross-pollinization? You know, you're, you're not just in your own discipline, but you are spreading your wings and you're, you're touching on different areas of... They're quiet. Nods, yeah. Well, it's a sinister. They, they, they've been touching on so many bases. We can switch <laughs> no, you, you, come, you all come up here and yeah, we... we <laughs> yeah, the Africans are available. I think as a student, you need to seek them out. You need to go to other yeah. students and you need to find out how I go to that class or mm. what kind of credit that would be for my department's wallet. Mm. So uh, here's a question. I, when I was in college, there was... Uh, we could do anything we wanted in a sense like that too, and it definitely was up to, uh, up to the student. The only thing that was that I didn't really get the sense was very clear was that you could do it. <laughs> was that there was an encouragement to say, do it. You just see what you... It is here. That's great. I have come in contact with visual studies. I have a master's program in the theater department. Mm -hmm. I'll see you next fall. Yay. <laughs> I came from the FA in sculpture and came from one of the other department of studies, also off of the state all those classes, but the composers were passing mm -hmm. behind us just left. <laughs> so we all worked together, dancers. That's really artists, interesting. Composers, artists. That's fantastic, you know, because I, I think that there's something in the kind of DNA of Buffalo that is hmm. uh, conducive to a kind of interaction of the arts, more so than in many other places where uh, that I have had contact with. I think Do you have any idea why? It's a, I, I don't know. I, w I mean, I would almost put the question to Bruce and Diane in the front row, because they've <laughs> certainly observed the situation with more critical thought than I have. Uh, in the 60s, when this became a state university, they brought in tons of practicing artists who hung out together, <laughs> uh, mm. hung out at the university and hung out in town. Yeah. And I think that continued. I think that's a very important point. When you bring creative individuals together and uh, you throw a little wine and food into the mix, uh, you know, it's a nuclear reaction. And affordable reactor. housing. Yeah, yeah that, uh, right. Very important. Very important. Um, we've hired, in the past four months, uh, several new staff members uh, with open searches, you know, national searches, and, and people from New York and uh, Chicago have moved to Buffalo. One of the attractions has been not only the fact that there is this great kind of infrastructure of uh, art and culture here, but there is a way to actually move around this place that's somehow still human. Because, you know, if you live as an artist in New York, for example, and uh, you have your studio in Williamsburg, and then no, you don't. Well, somewhere, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, yeah, in Brooklyn, uh, you have your you have a studio, or you don't. Uh, you share but, a studio. You share a studio with thirteen <laughs> other starving individuals, and your your two you know five year old kid has now been accepted into a, into a music school or to take music classes. Or uh, kindergarten uh, around Columbia. It'll take you know. You are in the car or subway or whatever mode of transportation for four or five hours a day. But that won't happen because you can't afford it anyway. You can't afford it. So, so life <laughs> in many places, uh, uh, such as New York City, has become quite impossible for creative individuals. The reason why Berlin became the epicenter mm -hmm. uh, of, of culture in Europe after the wall went down was because suddenly, boom, you had the other half of a, a city that was now united with relatively inexpensive real estate and studio space. So artists from all over Europe went to Berlin and, and made it their home. Be why? Because there, was, there were places to live in, and yet there was an infrastructure of culture that mm. was there. And those are the two things that uh, you, know, you could say that are required for the, the nuclear reaction of, of creativity to occur. You need places to, you need a teepee, you know, and preferably a comfortable one and spacious one, and that's warm if it's cold outside, and then you need universities and uh, cultural institutions. I mean, I, I'm, I've lived in the States for a long time, but I've also been gone for a long time. And, I mean, I understand how important it is to, or I try to understand, and I think I do, 
uh, how important it is to uh, use that tax dollars to support uh, things, you know, such as the Buffalo Bills. Are you a communist? No. <laughs> I'm a Finn. That's, that's like heresy. Uh, but I, 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 I think that, you know, uh, it's important also to support the cultural fabric of a community because in the end, if you think about it, culture is what gives and provides identity to a community and a society. Uh, and identity is born from the little fragments of culture that we have. And if we, you know, what do we fight for if we don't have identity to fight for? I mean, that, you know, it kind of becomes a futile thing. Because it's, you know, well. Just to, no, it just occurred to me. I, another... I don't like that communist <laughs> reference. My God. I mean, I mean, there, would be, there would be people who would be shocked at you yeah, I'm sorry. uttering the word. It happened in our country, too. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Oh, dear. Uh, <clears throat> I think our time's up, by the way. It's very likely. Should we ask for, for questions? Yes. OK, let's ask for questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for, for Yana? <laughs> for Doug? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. No. Oh, no questions. OK. Sometimes it takes a while. We should have planned it a few. I, we can plan a few. So, Doug, what do you think mostly about? Yes, sure. Idea. For the show? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be called something like, wait a second, I have it written down here and I didn't want to get it wrong suddenly. Somewhere. How did we? I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the show. How did we? I think. <laughs> what? I think. I think, yeah. About what? Or motherboard? Yes, of course we could definitely call it. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, it's not a bad idea. That's a very interesting idea. See, that's why we have these open conversations. <laughs> but what I've been doing is I've been making in my notebook lots and lots of little sketches of moments. I would call them. These are all. It's, it's not really a storyboard because a storyboard I would assume has more logical connection one to the next, and these don't. These are just are like. They're really not even meant to be pictures, per se. I would never paint these things. They're more like images that can only be made in a theatrical way. And only pictures that, are, that have, in some way, been designed to transform or metamorphose or, or, or change. Because for me, theater is primarily about transformations, and transformations from a character to what happens to that character or what happens to that space. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm largely because this is coming uh, from, a, a, from a heavily musical situation, and largely because I've been working heavily in, in musical organizations like these symphony orchestras, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, the rather than words being the means through which the story is told, I'm interested in having the visual, the story actually told in a way that only a visual transformation can tell a story, which is difficult to describe in words. Um, it's like saying, well, you could tell what's going on in the Mahler fourth, you know. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, emotional transformations are going on that are very clear to your spirit and to your, you know, to, to, to what you're feeling. But to put them into words is a little pointless and none doesn't work very well. Uh, you can say it did it well or it didn't do it well, but. So that's what I'm aiming for. It's a theater, It's kind of like an opera of images, and I, and I'd like to to play with um, notions of scale enormously. Uh, a one, um, and to tap into. Okay, so it, it's a little bit like a, a creation myth, um, a creation myth that uh, that kind of redesigns the possibility of where we came from. Maybe an Adam and Eve thing, but I'd like to revisit Adam and revisit Eve and how they came to be and what, how, they, how we ended up how, from who they are or who they might have been to where we are now, like a, a, a culture that's completely obsessed with celebrity and youth and overwhelmed with information that we can't use and told we need things that we don't and must be made insecure in order to buy things we don't need. And was that intended by the, you know? <laughs> 
by the Bible stuff. That, so a new kind of cultural uh, creational myth. Um, and simultaneously, I'm interested in sort of a, a, a double layer of what you might call landscape or, or nature and, and the nature of man, kind of these two kinds of things converging. So what does that look like? Uh, <clears throat> one place I have in mind a kind of a, a jungle of, um, a, a, a jungle, <laughs> Uh, like a rainforest, a beautiful rainforest, and you can sort of see people walking through it. And you think they notice it, because we in the audience notice it, but then somebody like leans a broom against the jungle and, and then opens a door into a place that couldn't have possibly been there, and, and you realize they're not looking at it as a jungle, they're looking at it as a piece of wallpaper or something. So uh, it's, um, it's how do you get us to, in the audience, take advantage of devices that are very theatrical? Uh, if I show you a a huge painting of a, of a jungle, I'm telling you that's a jungle, until I use it in a way that's not jungular, <laughs> if you know what I mean. So let's say then I brought, bring it down in front of that jungle painting, a series of uh, iPads and projection screens and uh, cell phones and just this jungle of technology. And that's all blinking and so on and so forth, but still this, be this beautiful natural jungle is sitting behind it, and there's an interaction that's very, very different with the people on stage. So what's the jungle, and which one is the most relevant one at the moment? <clears throat> that's a little bit of some of the issues. Of course, I'll say I'm tapping into other uh, social issues of our time without actually talking about them in words. For example, I'm interested in making a little high tea, <laughs> and when I say high tea, I'm talking about something very similar to like what we're doing here, except we'll be facing a little bit more like this, and we'll be having another leg like this, and except that our, the legs of our chairs would be 16 feet tall, and we're way up there, and there's a whole bunch of other people uh, down below. And they're all kind of wondering, they can't see up there very well, and we can't care down like that. So, so, so just take your tea and, ha, it's too hot. Dump it down there. <laughs> People scalding. Who cares? Um, an, an extra biscuit. Oh, it's stale. I can't stand it. And then so scrabbling around down below. This is, you can see there's a little picture that you could say in humor that talks about a, an, another part of the social scenario that we're dealing with today. Um, so I'm, uh, and that maybe that those, uh, that high T, the legs of this chair, the bottom, way down at the bottom, they look like tree trunks, but up on, up on the top, they're carefully scar carved into tone bent wood, you know, chairs and whatnot, so I think. So um, that's a bunch of the images that I'm playing with in, in that regard. I'll tell you one more thing. I'm really interested, and I hope we can do it, uh, in um, covering the stage floor with water. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Not so people can slip and slide. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I want to make, uh, the water is fabulous uh, theatrical material. And um, I want to start out by having on th this group of little islands or mountains that are in the middle of the water. And then there's a comet, and it hits. And then there are all, all these volcanoes that just erupt. And they're, you know, these mountains are this big, so they, but when you look at it from a stage, a stage picture, we don't know what scale they are. They look like we're being told, oh, that's the world. The world is being born or something. But then when you take one of the mountains and you unfurl it, like unpeel it, peel it like a potato and it goes up into the sky and there's someone waiting under there in a the chair and you say, well, that was not what I thought the mountain was. Um, maybe Eve appears under one of these mountains and the other ones start moving around with tectonic plate shiftings with musicians sitting on top of them quite comfortably. So the sense of scale is really, is that guy huge or is that mountain just a piece of furniture? And uh, so it's a lot like that. That's where I am at the moment. Yeah. Question for you, I'm sorry. Yeah. You've used the term and it's- I'll answer it. <laughs> <laughs> You've used the term uh, visual literacy in the brochure, and, and I've heard you use it before. Yeah. Can you just describe as concisely as possible mm. the, the problem that visual literacy, more visual literacy, would solve? How do you imagine the world? Is it about the world? Is it about us? Okay. What, what does the term mean to you okay. as, as a goal to achieve? Good. And I'll come to it by pointing to what Doug just said, as he painted with words an image in your mind. That's, that's an ekphrasis. 
you know, uh, the Renaissance notion of an ekphrasis, he takes an image and he gives it words. And in your minds, they're not the same images that he has here, but he painted some sort of an image of a volcano, for example. And it's uncurling, and the image or the figure that may be inside it. He painted visuality into your cerebral mindset by speaking. Now, in the Western world, ever since we entered the Gutenberg galaxy, 1450 onwards, um, alphabetic language, both written and the oral word, has been the hegemonic paradigm for the dissemination and absorption of knowledge. Uh, this is the reason why we today teach young kids to read and write from I guess in America it starts at age four really formally, or maybe five, and then continues through a PhD. However, language, the alphabetic uh, technology, is, is not as hegemonic anymore as it used to be. Uh, ever since the invention of, by the, of the camera and the cinema, the moving image, and then the ability to transfer uh, auditory data uh, through radio waves, Morse code evolving into radio and TV days ultimately. Uh, today, we'll, you know, the digital universe which we inhabit, the, the alphabet is no longer the hegemonic paradigm. So we have these diverse means and mechanisms for the communication of information. We still train ourselves in alphabetic literacy, but if I ask even an educated uh, audience of individuals, how many years of training you have had in visual literacy? The answer usually is none. How many courses of visual literacy does a first grade uh, elementary school student take? And yet we make most of the decisions in our lives with our eyes. Who do we kiss? Who don't we kiss? Who do we like? Who do we dislike? The cultures of hate, racism, uh, discrimination, social justice, these things are largely uh, coming into our consciousness through our optical apparatus, our eyes. So we're all the time, you know, or driving a car, or being an ice hockey goalie. Oh, I'm, you know, you think Tuka Rusk, the goalie of the Boston Bruins, is reading a manual as the, you know, the, the center guard guy is coming at him and he's getting, no. He's visually reading that scene or the alpine skier that's getting ready to go down the, the run of his or her life in the Olympics. He or she is projecting that run that's going to happen a little in advance. Internally. That, internally, and that's a visual literacy act. It's not like, it's a me, visualization. Uh, turn, it's a visualization. Let me turn to page three of the manual. How do I win the race? No. Many, many things that we do in our life are based on optics. We, we are inherently kind of making judgments all the time with our eyes. In my opinion, it would be good to have some formal critical training in this discipline. And art museums and any program in a university that has visuality kind of bound into it can really facilitate our ability to become visually more literate. In a nutshell. Yeah, hello. <laughs> uh, my question is for Dr. Saran. Um, I'm wondering if how museums with um, an international scope, such as the Albert Knox, play a role in establishing or helping to reaffirm a local cultural identity? Mm. Very good question. Um, by helping generate a sense of participatory pride in the inhabitants of a city or a region. Again, in a nutshell, it's very important uh, to feel proud of the place that you call home and feel good about it and that the things that are happening there are somehow fair and inclusive. So when you, you know, Paris could go broke, but the Parisians are going to remain proud till the doomsday comes because of their culture. It gives them such a sense of identity, such a sense of place and space that is theirs, that come what may, they're going to feel proud. And when they feel pride, proud of who they are as a community, 
they are able to survive even in dire situations. But when you take people's dignity away and the basic notion of pride, I think then you're really opening uh, a can of worms that can, in some situations, become very irreversible. Who do I look like? <laughs> oh. I do? I look like me? Fro Frodo? <laughs> Precious. <laughs> Precious. <laughs> does that uh, go in the right direction, or does that yeah, but make it's sense? An, it's, no, it's no accident, and it's interesting to think about how, okay, one of my, one of my mentors, who was who Italian, and I lived in Venice for a little while, he said, hey, Doug, it's very important for you not to live where, from, from where you come from. As a, if you're an artist, it's important not to be from where you are. And, and similarly true of p people who are running institutions, particularly in the United States, mm. for several reasons. I think the United States is still a little concerned that, that we don't know enough about how to run cultural institutions. And we better get a German person or a Finnish person or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> Finnish. But it, it, it is rather true, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it's very true of artists. Artists are outsiders just by nature and uh, by, by the nature of otherwise, if you're kind of an insider, you're kind of taking the world as it is for granted. And, um, and so you have to kind of be a little of each I th in every case. But I think people trust artists who have come from far away more than they would trust you know, the artist in their local town by default. And it's an interesting phenomenon. So yeah. a parallel universe thing or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's a great question because how do you create and believe in the culture that is local yeah. uh, in, a, in, a, in a really global wor world of branding? Yes. So Hello. Right now, the Baltimore Museum first. Um, I asked because UV has recently had a, a bit of a controversy. Our athletics. Uh, Teams have been rebranding as uh, adding New York as in New York State mm -hmm. into the brand rather than just you be your bubble. And so we were talking earlier about the local, the, the attraction of this community for you. Yes. Um, how is the Albright Knox the Buffalo Museum? Is it? Is it a New York State Museum? Uh -huh. Excellent question. So. A our, citizen of the world. Our vision states that the Albright Knox aspires to play a leading role on regional, national, and global stages. What does that mean? Think of a, I'm going to do a little acrosses here. Think of a quiet body of water. What is water. that word? I've never heard that word. Would you please yeah. spell it for me? <laughs> okay. A quiet body of water, a lake. You toss a rock into the middle of the lake, and there's a splash. Yeah. That's your museum. The first ripple, the first rim between the moment of the splash and where the first ripple is, that's your local community. Then there's a little mountain there, the, the tension, then comes the layer of the next ripple. That's the nation. Then there's again hmm. a little mountain, and then there's another ripple. That's the globe, and on and on it goes. But in my example to you, in this mental picture, there's the locality, the, let's say, Erie County, or city of Buffalo and Erie County, then the national sphere, and then the global sphere. Now imagine yourself as an eagle, or a bird of whatever sort, and you're flying over this event, and you see this beautiful, symmetrical thing on this quiet body of water, where there's the museum, the splash, and then these three ripples. And it all looks harmonious and symmetric and, and, and logical. Now. Imagine yourself as a little frog in the inner ripple, trying to look to where the second ripple is and the third. You don't see them now because there's a mountain range in between in your line of sight. So theoretically, we can say that, yes, we you know, aspire to do this, this, and that. When we are with our hands in the mud in our day-to-day -day work, it requires different actions to play a leading role here in the national realm and in the international realm. Because what I do here, the, the, this talk, my presence here today, will have no impact on the standing, I mean, it might, but the chances are low that it will have a significant impact on the standing of the Albright Knox as a global institution, let's say, from the vantage point of Beijing. But when we acquire 
a really important work of art that is resonant on a global realm. And we put it on the wall of the Albright Knox. And then I come here and talk about it to you. I have somehow attempted to build a, a, a passageway through those mountain ranges that represent tension and some sort of conflict, potentially. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah. I, I'd add one more thing to that. Yeah. When the Albright creates an exhibit, that's what the key for, yeah. where you put one painting in one room. Yes. Uh, that becomes part of Buffalo culture. Yes. That, that is a Buffalo event. Yes. Even though it has international implications. Absolutely. In Absolutely. So, even though the art comes from elsewhere, yeah. the context and the idea of the exhibit itself and what those generate is are, here. Yes. A museum, by its definition, and thus, is always a local institution because there's a point where the rock hits the body of water. That's always going to be the case with any museum. But the way in which you negotiate what happens in those other ripples and how you engage them and how you engage the dialogues that occur in those outer rims, how those dialogues impact what you do on your local wall, that's kind of the bridging act uh, you know, of, of the work. So there are tensions, but they're not contradictory necessarily. It just takes hard work to remain relevant on multiple uh, theaters of action. Does that make sense? Yeah, time up. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>